We went for a walk in the garden. It's a perfect garden. Panorama of flowers whose beauty is deeply moving. They are so tall on their stems that they seem to walk along with us. Today, for the first time, Monet took me across the road and the railway line, beyond which the garden extends, but where the landscape changes its appearance completely. There is Monet's pond where his water lilies float. Surrounded by his pale willows, a pond which he has created as God created the caprices of nature. love to try and compartmentalise artists so they have singular disciplines. You've got a painter, you've got a sculptor. No sense that, as Michelangelo was, a great sculptor can be a great draftsman or that a great painter can also be a great sculptor. And Monet was clearly a great sculptor because in his garden he's sculpting nature. He's making sure that there are larger flowers, smaller flowers, there are darker tones, there are lighter tones, there are colours that are fighting against one another and dragging you through the scene. It's a great natural sculpture. I don't think you should undermine quite how important that kind of creativity is in our world. So every person who goes out into their own garden and creates a space for them is building something that can have the same effect on you as a wonderful painting, that can allow you to immerse yourself, to retreat, to find solace in beautiful things. I mean, artists have always had a fascination with gardens because artists can't help but have a fascination with, with nature. You know, Durer, Botticelli, Charles René Mackintosh, Monet, Matisse, these are all people who find in a simple flower a whole universe, you know, in the, in the structures, in the engineering in the elegance and beauty and simplicity of a flower, you really can find a whole world. And that's what you're doing when you're mixing up colors on a palette. You're finding whole new opportunities to express yourself in very simple acts. And nature expresses so much, gardens can express so much, even in a space that we just seem to take for granted so often. Money was trying to experiment with colour all the time and so flowers gave him this opportunity and we can see by the sorts of colour combinations in the garden that he would be taking uh, beds where he would be using the oranges, the reds and yellows and he'd mix them all together. But you'll see in his paintings that whenever he does a, a colour scheme, then um, even if it's a bluish scheme, there'll always be touches of yellow, touches of pinks and you'll have touches of colours which set off the colour that he's he's working with. Now the other thing is that Moni was always looking for new varieties, looking for new colours. If he could find better varieties, new varieties, then he would be putting them into his garden. So a garden isn't a museum, a garden is, is a living uh, tribute to, to Moni, um, combining harmonious colours and then waking this up with, with, with an opposing colour, the purples with the, with, 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 the, with the oranges, the blues with the yellows. And this is very striking in the garden, strong colors which, which uh, shake you a little bit and it's the opposite of the, the good taste uh, of, of, of English gardens. Mm -hmm. 
story of modern art is told in many different ways. We know that the development of photography is central to it. We know that the re-exploration of so-called primitive cultures or non-Western cultures is also a driving force. But I think what this exhibition starts to make clear is that the garden has been a very underrated site in the development or the evolution of modern art. In a way, it's modern life, it's the painting of modern life, as well as the kind of abstract force or power of nature that gets combined in so many of these paintings. There was always a danger that an exhibition focusing on gardener subject matter veered towards the schmaltzy, the saccharin, the chocolate boxy. But actually, the exhibition was very clear from the beginning that it wanted to affirm the importance of gardens for artists of the avant-garde, of the broad avant-garde. And I think the exhibition makes that case very clearly. Never been a major exhibition, to my knowledge, looking at the role of the garden in the evolution of modern art. And certainly, familiar artists like Monet and Matisse um, are reconfigured, I think, in an interesting context. I think the premise of this exhibition, the linkage between art and gardens, is really interesting and timely, partly because of the low cultural status of gardens in the hierarchy of the arts, which is sort of somewhere down with knitting, say, or embroidery and other what we might call applied arts nowadays. But I think as this exhibition shows, many of the greatest artists of the early 20th century were interested, if not obsessed, with their gardens and the different effects, chromatic effects, the effects of atmosphere and place. They were really interested in exploring garden, first of all as subject matter for their own work, but in some cases, most notably in Monet's case, of course, the garden itself becomes an artwork in its own right. Monet's primary stimulus was, I think he just loved gardening and he loved plants. His gardening and his art are so closely related. I think there's a unique symbiosis between the two. I think he created his garden as an artist. You know, he saw the blocks of color that he was planting like pigments on a palette. He once said, aside from painting and gardening, I'm good for nothing. And so these two passions completely dominated his life and shaped his career. And I think there is something heroic in the idea of the artist gardener to, up to the level which Monet took it. And I think all of these things, the garden and his art, they all wove together to create an extremely uh, powerful and strong public identity for him. We think Monet may have been the greatest painter of gardens in the history of art, but he wasn't alone. There are many other artists who are invested in this subject deeply. Artists you might expect other impressionists because they're obviously interested in the natural world, but I think other artists that people will be surprised to learn were also active gardeners, fascinated by gardeners, and you see a wide range of them in the exhibition. They are dedicated to the project of modernity. <laughs>
garden, I think, has a very wide context in the 19th century. We have to remember this is the century of Darwin, after all, his origin of species in 1859 draws people's attention to the possibility that the world wasn't created just in seven days, but has a longer history going back to fossils and the evidence that they offer. And of course, in a sense, he is therefore exploding Darwin, the whole concept of paradise and of the Garden of Eden, and these places of perfection that have underpinned so much of Western cultural thought and tradition. There are depictions of the Garden of Eden and uh, ancient uh, manuscripts. Of course, it becomes a really crucial subject. During the medieval period, you have depictions of the Virgin, and there are all kinds of in a garden, and there are uh, conventions about that. She's in an enclosed garden, which is symbolic of her virginity. During the Baroque era, the uh, gardens were a significant aspect, actually, of royal power, because you have great kings, um, Louis XIV and others, creating e magnificent, enormous gardens. Most people know the gardens at Versailles, but this occurred in many places in Europe. And these were actually an expression of the king's power. This whole culture began to change in the 19th century, when you had a rise of a middle class, and more people could have time to do private pleasure gardening as opposed to practical gardening just for growing vegetables. Now they're doing this for personal pleasure. Um, there's a lot of feelings about the, that this uh, contributes to the health of family life, to the health of the culture. And you also have at the same time um, new varieties and species of flowers and plants being imported from around the world, from Asia, Africa, the Americas. And of course, we have science intersecting here. And they're taking these imported varieties. They're creating new hybrids. And artists get involved with this new floriculture, this an attempt to really create new types of species and varieties. And that is all facilitated by technological developments, because for the first time also from the 1820s, there is a really effective way of carrying plants and not just seeds back from foreign lands. These include the, the Wardian case invented by a British doctor, Dr. Nathaniel Bagshaw Ward, and then we have also the greenhouse being developed, the conservatory, and that enables these exotic plants to be overwintered, also enables them to be brought on and then planted out. And in a way, people are having, I think, to rethink the relationship they as, as individuals have with nature. I think there are certain plants which are recurring within these canvases that when you garden with them, you understand why they're here. Dahlias, for instance, are an extraordinary thing in themselves. They're incandescent. When they flower, they break all the rules of what goes with what. The dahlia grower is fascinated in the flower, and that juxtaposition of two things creates often this tremendous tension and a clash. There are poppies which appear again and again, which also have that amazing ability to jump out of a landscape. There are chrysanthemums for the same reason. And they're things which, in a way, are larger than life flowers, peonies. There are things which take over a moment, which make a particular time of year as a color exercise. It is a wonderfully freeing thing.
rise of you know, modern gardening as we know it today. It's, it's often referred to as the great horticultural movement. One aspect of it was these great uh, horticultural shows, rather like the Hampton Court Flower Show today or the shows put on by the Royal Horticultural Society. And we know that Monet was an enthusiastic visitor to these shows. Well, horticulture is an amazing thing because it, it links art with science, perhaps more than almost any other practice. So it's inevitable, really, that people like Monet, who become seriously interested in gardens, then get seriously interested in the te technical side of things at a very advanced level. So we are talking Claude Monet and Gustave Kaibod. I'm sure there are one or two more, but they're the, the main ones, and they were great gardening buddies. And they were interested in going to the flower exhibitions, seeing the water lilies bred by Latour, Marliac, or the great nurseries, like the French nurseries like Valmoran at this time, breeding chrysanthemums and dahlias in new forms. And we know that Monet, like many a keen gardener, was really obsessed by novelty. He orders these special new hybrid species of water lilies, largely produced by a grower who still exists in France today called La Tour Maliac. What was new at the time, they were these uh, bright pink and even red, and I believe sometimes scented water lilies, whereas the more common variety were white or yellow. But I think Monet um, is very keen on having the, these accents of pink and red in the overall gray, green, watery uh, environment of the pond. So he, he's, he's creating a garden with an artist's eye. And he's also creating a garden or an environment as a subject for him to paint over which he has a great deal of control. really important development that contributes to the great horticultural movement is the crossing of one species of plant with another hybridization which begins in earnest really uh, from the 19th century and gathers momentum and enables ever bigger ever more colorful ever more scented varieties to be developed and we have things like 200 different species of irises developing by the the late 19th century there are crosses made similarly with gladioli roses a, a, another hugely uh, Im important development where different colors, types, varieties are all coming to the fore. So there is this feeling for nature that you are controlling nature that you're organizing, but also nature that is itself and through the garden, bubbling up and always surprising you perhaps with new growth, looking to the future, looking beyond the present through that growing process. Paint upon a palette, delighting our eyes with soul-satisfying pictures. A treasure of well-set jewels, a sympathy with growing things, fashioned into a dream of beauty. A place of perfect rest and refreshment of mind and body. This sense of beauty is a gift of God. who were discussing the importance of gardening to family life. This was a place where French civilization could be reborn, where um, this was a healthy place for, to, to be with children and, and families. And, and that is seen, actually, in the Impressionist paintings. And there's paintings by Monet where you see a couple in the background, and it's a reference to the Garden of Love. So it becomes part of sort of everyday bourgeois life. And that really is a primary subject for the Impressionists but other artists working in this period. It's all about a sort of quiet domestic idyll, or very often that becomes a very popular subject with artists. So I think the garden, the, the small private garden, fits very well into that 
general view of the world. And so the need to escape to nature and to the restorative powers of nature and gardening become very strong. We begin the exhibition with two very interesting paintings. One is by Monet of his Dahlia garden in the house he was renting at Argenté, which is just outside of Paris, in the early 1870s. Here he's a poor, struggling artist. This is just the moment when the Impressionist group is beginning to emerge. He couldn't afford his own house. He's just living in rented properties. But wherever he went, he made a garden. And next to it, we're very happy to get the loan of a painting by Renoir, painting Monet, painting the Dahlia Garden. These two pictures together tell us quite a lot. First of all, they tell us that dahlias were a very popular flower. Uh, it also sort of shows the companionship and this sort of camaraderie between these young Impressionists when they were a fringe avant-garde group. There we have Monet standing before his easel, he's got his brush extended, he's putting a touch of colour on the canvas. We don't see the picture he's painting, Renoir leaves that to our imagination, but we can see that it must be the, the great mass of dahlias alongside. And it's as though Monet's taking his colours from those dahlias and transferring them with the brush to the canvas. The garden is obviously an outdoor studio. You can use it as an extension of your house in order to get at first hand the effects of light and atmosphere that become increasingly important with the rise of planerisme, painting out of doors. And those elements of modern life can be found, can be situated in a garden. And that, in a way, is, is a means of merging the modern life theme with the outdoor painting theme, and the garden is a useful meeting point for the two. Monet, most famously, but so many other artists were additionally also equally interested in gardening. They had their own gardens, they had greenhouses and gardeners, and they were really invested in this, this new uh, culture. And importantly, this served as a major source of inspiration for their art. I mean, Monet had a particularly close relationship with certain horticulturalists and gardeners and plants people, uh, particularly Latour Maliac, who bred the new species of colorful water lilies, uh, but also another man called Georges Truffaut. The way that Monet planted the clonal monde, I think particularly if you look at the paintings of irises, where you get these sort of wonderful drifts of color, I think he is aware of the great English designers of the late 19th century, particularly William Robinson and also Gertrude Jekyll, who advocated this kind of looser drifts of colour, which is very different from the sort of planting that we see in a painting right at the beginning of the exhibition of Monet's aunt's garden at Saint Adresse, which has you know, a round bed of geraniums with standard rows in the middle. It's very much more sort of formal geometric planting. He's doing something very different at Giverny. He's still planting in blocks of colour, but with this much, much sort of looser sense. And I think that is uh, an influence that is coming either directly or indirectly from these great English garden designers. The great gardening guru of the period, William Robinson, the author of The Wild Garden. Robinson wasn't actually um, promoting a wild garden as we might think of it, like a garden completely left to rack and ruin almost. But his idea of a wild garden was allowing plants to express themselves in a natural way. In his day, Robinson was a household name, a really influential writer. 
he started gardening in Ireland in a couple of gardens and then came over to London in the 1860s to become a gardener at the New Botanic Gardens at Regent's Park. And it was there that he started writing and went on to become a phenomenally successful garden writer and wrote some really influential books. English Flower Garden, which was the first book really to detail how we use mixed borders. The other very important one is The Wild Garden, which really is probably one of his most influential works, which was all about naturalistic planting and a bit of a revolution against this static Victorian horticulture. Basically, we're talking about welcoming nature into the garden and naturalizing plants. But within that, we're still gardening. We're still exercising an amount of control over what we're growing and how it's growing. And also, we're looking at how we're using color and form still, but in a very subtle way. And we're trying to enhance what we find in nature. A wild garden could be naturalized bulbs in a meadow. It could be self-sown annuals running through a mixed border. It could be some exotic shrubs that have been planted in a woodland. It's about enhancing what we've got from nature and, and um, developing it into a garden. It's much easier in a garden if things are neat and tidy and clean and simple. In a wild garden, it's a fine line between a beautiful naturalistic planting and a tangled mess. And the management of that becomes quite a challenge. The first edition of the Wild Garden didn't actually do all that well. And it wasn't until a later edition when Alfred Parsons illustrated the book that suddenly it really took off. I mean, first of all, they were very beautiful wood engravings that they used. And secondly, by having little pictures in, in each page, I think that it showed the reader that you don't need to have a grand estate. You can actually do this in a little corner in any garden, and it, it sort of linked that. It was very nice. Robinson was always very conscious about the way the garden was captured and recorded by artists. Of course, uh, the photography at that time wasn't quite what it is now, and the painter could do so much more justice. And the, he always had an artist in residence. There was a whole heap of artists that came here to paint and that he was in close contact with. So Sargent, Alfred Parsons, Beatrix Parsons. And I think it must have been a really vibrant place to come. This painting by Tissot was one of a group that he did in his home in St. John's Wood in London. A wonderful garden he developed there, which was modelled partly on the Parc Monceau in Paris. I think there is a, a tremendous theme running through Tissot's work, where we have the woman as someone who is to be admired almost as an object, but also a mystery. And the garden is traditionally associated with the woman. The woman is described as the good genius of gardens in some of the 19th century horticultural journals. But equally, she's the one who in the, the ancient tradition of the biblical narrative, for example, the virgin and her hortus conclusus, that underpins a lot of the imagery of the woman in the garden still in the 19th century. And he's maybe just blurring those boundaries so that we don't quite know if the woman is in the traditional mode of a virgin in a garden or in a rather more risque mode because conservatories were certainly places where seduction and all sorts of license was, was happening. It was a space, the garden itself in turn, where you might dispense with etiquette that would have ruled in the drawing room or the parlor salon. So there are, I think, little hints maybe that Tiso is manipulating the tradition and not just giving us a standard version of a woman in a garden. Here we've got chrysanthemums, which were plants introduced in 1789 to Europe, 
Uh, they came from the Orient, from China, Japan, and they were an immediate um, sensation, really, and developed into a whole variety of, of forms and shapes. And, and there was a great art in picking them, cutting them, so that you would develop the best for the next year. You could also take various other forms of, of growth and, and make them come on. I always find looking at paintings of gardens or flowers can you usually tell fairly quickly if the person who's painted it has a real interest in the subject. There's something about the way they depict the flowers in, in particular, I suppose the form of the whole plant. They are able to honour the plant. They're interested enough in it as an entity, as a, a, um, a being in the world, if you like, to actually spend an awful lot of time over it, as, just as much time as they might spend over a portrait of a person. But in some cases, most notably in Monet's case, of course, the garden itself becomes an artwork in its own right. If I could see one day Claude Monet's garden, I really feel I would see a garden in more tones and colour than flowers. A garden which could be less an old flower garden than a colourist garden, so to speak. Flowers displayed together, but not as nature, because they were sown so that only the flowers with matching colours will bloom at the same time harmonized to the infinite in all ranges of blue or pink. A powerful manifestation of the artist's intent to dematerialize them, of everything but color. Monet had been living in rented houses throughout the 1870s, first at Argenté and then further out along the Seine at Vete, where he made another beautiful garden. By this time, he was living with Alice Oshte, and between them, they had a very large family of children, so he needed a large house. And in 1883, he rented the house, Le Pressoir, it's called at Giverny. And in 1890, he borrowed money from his dealer, Durand-Ruel, to buy it. But from the moment he moved there, he started working on the garden. He was not so well off at this stage, so he did a great deal of the gardening himself. He got his children to help with the weeding. And gradually, the garden evolved and developed. And then in 1893, he applied for planning permission to, for a plot of land that was just the other side of a small railway line to make a water garden. And he had quite a lot of trouble getting the planning permission for that. The local residents in Giverny objected. They were rather suspicious of Monet anyway, and the farmers thought that these weird aquatic plants he was planning to grow would poison the water and kill the cattle. But finally, he got the planning permission and, of course, created the wonderful water lily garden. Now, it's very interesting the way that this garden was laid out when Monet got here, straight lines, uh, very French gardens. And we know that uh, Monet experimented with uh, these straight lines. He thought that by using plants in different ways and using colors in different ways, and he could exaggerate the perspective using these straight lines. And, and it's well known today, but, but Monet was probably a Picasso in this uh, subject, is that by using blues in the garden that throws the, the, the distance, or exaggerates the distance, and by using colors, reds and, and, and strong colors, then it comes, brings the, the garden close. So we know the main alley, that he played with these things. I don't think he'd perfected it, but he was playing around, experimenting with the purples and the blues, behind this using oranges and reds of the daily. So Monet, he was playing around, experimenting, trying to give distance and to bring distance closer towards him. Uh, now, we would use that differently today, but Monet, as I say, uh, was experimenting. I hadn't quite worked that one out. And, uh, and Monet, with his painter's eye, uh, had a very special way of looking at gardens and planting them to paint. <laughs> 
Impressionism often tried to eliminate too much emotion from the way that these artists observed the world, but increasingly I think they found that as an individual, as an artist, you can't help but be subjective about what you see. And in this garden, there is definitely the sense of Monet as a person who is moved by enjoyment, by the great thrill and fun of nature, by the constant curiosity, because there's not one simple bank of flowers here. It's change after change, after surprise, after transformation of scale. And you could burrow your way into a bush here and you would find interest for hours. So every time I can imagine Moni walking out into this garden, depending on what stage of the day it was, I suspect he would have recognised the various atmospheres, the feelings that the different light conditions would elicit from him. And Moni's eye was, was a very special eye. It, it could percept uh, the, the warmth of the light, and so he would be painting the series, uh, the same subject, many, many times, and he would begin a painting in the morning, and we can see at what time of the day he started the painting, because the light would be a cool colour, a cold colour, pinks and blues. And as the light got stronger, got warmer, he would change the painting and take the same subject and paint it with a, a yellow light as the light was getting warmer, and then an orange. Uh, and so he would change his painting as the day went on. He would wake up in the morning, throw his windows open uh, and look out uh, and if the light was good he would go out there and paint. And if the light wasn't good he would get into a rage and a depression and wouldn't come out and wouldn't eat and wouldn't talk with people and stay indoors because the light was everything for money. It was so important. Uh, he lived according to the light. Your imagination isn't broad enough to encapsulate the universe of qualities that you get uh, in the difference between light and shade. And being outside, it's, it, you know, it's so inspiring, it's so invigorating because you have to look and look and look again. It, it, within, within the smallest shadows that you see perhaps in a photograph, where it just looks like it's purple or blue or grey or whatever it might be, the minute you're outside, the minute you're confronted by the motif, the subject, you see a myriad of colours and my job is to search those out and to reproduce them on canvas and on paper in a way that will evoke that feeling that I have of being in the open air. And that's very exciting for an artist. It's, and for me, it's, uh, it's a great challenge because it's the light that gives the colour to everything that we see and the challenge is not to get too caught up in the palette of colours that you normally use, you're used to using, but to respond to what's in front of you. From an empty meadow, without trees, but watered by a babbling and winding arm of the river Ept, he created a true fairy garden. Digging a large pond in the middle, planting at the edge of this pond exotic trees and willows whose branches fell in long tiers along the bank, drawing all around the valley arches of greenery, intertwining, giving the illusion of a big park. Sowing on the pond thousands and thousands of water lilies whose rare and chosen species were colored by all the tints of the prism, from purple, red and orange to pink, lilac and mauve, and placing where the Ept met the pond one of his small rustic humped bridges. Baudelaire writes of poetry being a language that uses flowers for uh, inspiration and there are all sorts of um, ways in which this concept of colour itself as found in flowers becomes suggestive, expressive. So I think the garden's a sort of generative place. Ideas are sparking out of it, and it's a point of focus for politics, art, science.
I think Monet was very involved in the public perception of himself. Uh, and I think that the art and the garden and the house and everything all contributed to this, you know, a, a very formidable public persona. But he was always very pleased to welcome distinguished artists, writers amongst his circle of friends and acquaintances. Stefan Malamé went there quite often. The writer Octave Mirbeau wrote uh, in very colourful style, actually wrote the first literary account of the garden. Rodin visited Matisse Bonnard, Vuillard, his great friend, the Prime Minister Clemenceau. They were all frequent visitors at Giverny. He was a pater familias. He enjoyed, I think, being head of this large family. The studio sitting room was full of life and youth in 1886, when I went there for the first time. Young girls, young men, adolescents, the children and the stepchildren of Madame Monet. The meal finished, we returned to the studio to have a coffee, crossing the blue sitting room which contains Monet's library. It is here that Madame Monet, surrounded by her children and Monet's children, appeared in all her peaceful splendor, her eyes sparkling under a halo of powdered hair. Well, there are both modern gardens and there's modern paintings of gardens, and there's a great variety. There's a tremendous variety. For Monet, it's growing new types of plants, new, more spectacular varieties of flowers, uh, arranging them specifically in color harmony. So he's orchestrating environments so that they're blooming in different colors at different times of the year. For other artists, it's the way they interpret the garden that's modern. I think many people are aware of the role that the gardens play for the Impressionists. They become places where the effects of light and atmosphere can be explored. But actually, gardens are so much more than that from the middle of the 19th century onwards for artists. They become places of reverie. They become sites of imagination. They become laboratories of experimentation. It's an aspect of the modern world, and it's an aspect of the natural world that sort of fused. Gardens become places that artists can create and then in turn they inform the paintings and I think also the relationship symbiotic. I think the paintings then start to inform the garden. So it's this multi-layered complex scenario that I think is richer and deeper even than we thought before. We hope that people coming to the exhibition will get great pleasure from seeing a number of spectacular works of art by famous and well-known artist Monet, of course, who's really the heart of the exhibition, but also works by Matisse, by other Impressionist artists. And then there's Bonnard's garden at Vernonnet, which is up in Normandy on the Seine, only about um, three miles from Giverny, in fact. But it couldn't be more different from Monet's very carefully planned and designed garden. Bonnard really just let nature take its course. He called it Mon Jardin Sauvage, my wild garden. And when you go there today, there's really very little evidence of, of a formal garden, certainly. But nevertheless, this garden, with its panoramic view out to the Seine beyond, is the setting of many of Bonnard's paintings. Mm. 
We have many paintings too by perhaps less familiar names, but artists who really responded to the theme of the garden in many different ways. Uh, Max Liebermann made a garden on Lake Wannsee, just outside of Berlin. Liebermann's garden follows this uh, idea current in German design at the time of constructing the garden around a series of outdoor rooms. So there's a rose garden, there's a hedge garden, there's a sort of kitchen garden on, at, at the back of the house, and then there are four more flower beds, and then a long birch alley, which to lead as a sort of avenue down to the lake, providing these viewpoints and perspectives. Die Liebermann Villa am Wannsee wurde in den Jahren 1909, 1910 gebaut nach den Vorstellungen des Malers Max Liebermann. Er hat den Garten zusammen mit dem Freund Alfred Lichtwag von der Hamburger Kunsthalle gestaltet und hat diese unterschiedlichen Gartenbereiche festgelegt, den Heckengarten, die große Wiese, den Staudengarten und auch den Birkenweg weil er sehr interessiert war für die neueren Bestrebungen der Gartenkunst und insbesondere für den Reformgarten und für die neuen Bestrebungen einer Reformierung der Gartenkunst. Das war es, was ihn interessierte. Und da hatte er auch einige Schriften verfasst. Und deshalb war der Austausch für Liebermann auch so wichtig und so fruchtbar, mit diesem Mann zusammen diesen Garten zu planen. Es ist eine Zeit, in der auch in Deutschland die künstlerische Entwicklung schon viel weiter fortgeschritten ist, wo der Expressionismus schon längst seine Bilder gezeigt hat, wo wir auch schon die ersten abstrakten Gemälde haben, wo Dada in Deutschland virulent war und auch schon das Bauhaus gegründet war. In der Folge wurde Liebermann dann 1889 einer der Führer der deutschen künstlerischen Moderne. Er gründete mit vielen anderen Künstlern zusammen die Berliner Sezession, deren langjähriger Präsident er war. Die Gartenbilder von Max Liebermann prägen das Spätwerk des Meisters. Sie sind, könnte man schon sagen, die, die letzte große Blüte des deutschen Impressionismus und ein Werkkomplex, der erstaunlich geschlossen ist und in dem Liebermann noch einmal eine ganz erstaunliche Variabilität in der skizzenhaften Wiedergabe von Natur erreicht. Eigentlich malte er draußen der Kontakt zur Natur, der Kontakt zu den Motiven, die er dort draußen sah, das war für ihn ganz entscheidend wichtig.
weil auch immer die Beleuchtung so entscheidend war. Je nachdem, wie das Licht sich in den Blättern der Bäume brach oder wie das Licht auch die Farben der Blüten veränderte, das versuchte er in seinen Gemälden festzuhalten. Und deshalb malte er auch immer wieder ähnliche Motive, immer wieder die Blumenterrasse oder immer wieder auch den Birkenweg zu unterschiedlichen Tageszeiten, zu unterschiedlichen Beleuchtungssituationen, um die Vielfalt des Motives je nach Lichteinstellung in seinen Kompositionen festhalten zu können. So there are many different ways in which gardens could be organized and uh, artists were really searching for something that was particular to them in their culture. The Sorolla, for example, in Spain laid out an interior courtyard garden in a series of rooms in its house uh, and he had pools and water. This was a place of reflection for family life but also for spiritual thinking. En España, Sorolla se considera seguramente el mejor pintor del siglo XIX. ¿no? Eh, esta es una reputación que ahora mismo está bastante consolidada. Él se consideró siempre un pintor naturalista. Eh, solo, digamos, ya en la segunda mitad de su vida reconocí, se reconocía a sí mismo como un pintor impresionista. Eh, pero realmente su estilo... Eh, tiene rasgos bastante, bastante diferentes ¿no? tiene en común con el impresionismo el interés fundamental por la luz y por la pintura al aire libre o sea, esos dos principios fundamentales del impresionismo Sorolla los comparte al 100% pero digamos que Sorolla mantuvo siempre un enorme interés porque la, digamos, la pincelada deshecha que utilizan los, los impresionistas a él le parecía que destruía eh, la coherencia de la forma, la solidez de la forma y él no quería perderla, de manera que él utilizaba otro tipo de pincelada y otro tipo de, de, de composición para no perder nunca esa solidez de la forma. ¿no? Él en eso reconocía como su gran maestro a Velázquez porque él entendía que Velázquez había sabido mantener la construcción muy sólida de la forma sin perder la impresión de la atmósfera eh, circundante. Él al principio quería un jardín muy arqueológico, con muchas eh, estatuas y restos arqueológicos, luego cambia de idea, va plantando distintas cosas, eh, pre, probablemente porque él no tenía conocimientos específicos de jardinería, probablemente hizo muchos intentos fallidos, de cosas que plantó y no se dieron bien o no le fueron satisfactorias. Eh, eh, yo creo que él actuaba mucho por impulsos y, por, y improvisaba continuamente. Uh -huh. en los cuadros de los jardines se vendieron muchos en Estados Unidos. De hecho, Sorolla, eh, algunas de las campañas que hizo de pintura de jardines fue pensando en sus exposiciones en Estados Unidos porque eran un tema, digamos, muy específicamente español uh -huh. y con posibilidad de que en aquel mercado gustaran y en efecto vendió muchos en los Estados Unidos. One of the questions you might ask yourself, even subconsciously, standing in front of one of these paintings is, do I believe this is a real place? Does this garden actually exist? 
And in the case of a painting like this, it is absolutely the case. But I think it's not, in a way, the question isn't so much, does this garden exist? It's does, did that moment exist? In an earlier age, this picture would have been called a, a swagger painting because it shows a very successful man in his white suit at his weekend home on Long Island, just outside New York. It's Louis Comfort Tiffany, the famous designer. So he's painting, he's showing us his artistic side and his skill, but this is a very successful man. And the flowers, I think, interestingly, are used in this painting by Soroya as a way of bolstering his credentials as a man of the world. They're almost uh, machismo, these blooms. I think, actually, they are uh, mainly hydrangeas massed behind him in different colours. But their bulbous blooms are almost... It's almost like he's the sort of artistic Napoleon, and this is his imperial guard backing him up behind with his dog as well, and all these accoutrements, if you like, of the, the country gentleman you might see in a, in a Gainsborough or something. Well, I think a lot of these artists created gardens because it did in a way, make an outdoor studio for them. And other artists, for example, if you take uh, Henri Le Cidane, another French artist, created a beautiful garden, a rather romantic garden, in the village of Gerboa in Picardy. His gardens are sort of fused with a, a mood of poetic nostalgia, and he particularly liked the, the twilight hours at dusk because it sort of envelops the garden in this sort of dreamlike atmosphere. So I think those paintings are actually largely done on, in an inside studio rather than painted up on the spot, although no doubt he, he made sketches and really observed the scene outside. But he needed that kind of remove from actually being in the garden itself in order to, to create this poetic atmosphere. Alors d'abord, le Sidaner était un passionné de la nature, ça c'est la première chose. Un infatigable promeneur, un amoureux des vieilles pierres, des, 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 des jardins, des vieilles allées, des villes d'autrefois. Mais ces paysages avaient ceci de particulier, que la présence humaine y était toujours évoquée, sans, sans jamais être montrée, mais toujours évoquée, c'est-à-dire qu'il ne peignait jamais de purs paysages. Donc, on pourra dire que le Sidaner est surtout un peintre de la lumière, beaucoup plus que de la couleur. D'ailleurs, ses amis disaient qu'il y avait cette heure le Sidaner. L'heure le Sidaner, c'est le moment où, où le crépuscule commence à s'installer. Et bon, pour le, pour le Sidaner, la lumière euh, le, le, correspond à un état d'esprit. Je crois que... Euh, Vraiment, c'est ce qui fait une des spécificités de son art. C'est probablement la raison pour laquelle le public, devant un tableau d'Henri Le Sidaner, va confusément sentir qu'on lui parle de lui-même. Ce sentiment qui, que donnent les tableaux d'intimité. Effectivement, quand on lui posait la question, il avait l'habitude de répondre qu'il n'appartenait à aucun mouvement en particulier. Mais si vous voulez absolument me classer, dites que je suis un intimiste. Le Sidaner est un peintre d'atelier. Cela veut dire qu'il commence son travail sur le motif, avec un croquis de dessin. Il peint une première étude sur bois, éventuellement une deuxième, après un dessin plus sophistiqué, et avec une mise au carreau, comme on le voit dans ce dernier tableau qui, a laissé, qui est resté dans l'atelier après sa mort. Avec cette technique de mise au carreau, il reproduit son dessin précisément sur sa toile. Et après commence véritablement le travail du peintre. Pour cela, on peut dire que la mémoire intervient avant tout. Il peint de mémoire, même s'il va retourner sur son motif pour vérifier la qualité de sa lumière, mais c'est surtout un peintre de la mémoire. C'est ce qu'il faisait dire à Marcel Proust, qui a beaucoup parlé de le Sidaner dans la recherche du temps perdu, que la peinture... Euh, comme le souvenir avait ce signe merveilleux, c'est qu'elles faisaient, elles avaient toutes les deux la capacité de faire ressortir les réminiscences, qui, est des, qui étaient d'après Marcel Proust des éléments les plus vivaces 
de, de, du sentiment humain. Donc, c'est véritablement un peintre de la mémoire. Some gardens are quite charged psychological spaces and certainly certain gardens that I have in my mind or in my memory, uh, sometimes I don't know if I've dreamed them or they're actually places I've visited because the way they sit there in, in your memory is so close to kind of dream space or spaces you might recall. But I love the way people plant trees, trees that they, they might never see bear fruit, trees that will only come to maturity long after they're gone. I mean, that, that's a wonderful kind of optimistic uh, sense of your place in the world. And that sense of leaving something behind you, that again, is a great privilege as an artist when you make a work that's permanent. The garden itself is not the subject of my work, but it's more how I'm brought into contact with the processes of living things and the interconnectivity in a garden, how one thing affects another and how the rhythms of the natural year exist beyond me, beyond all the timekeeping I do, beyond all the kind of knowing when I'm meant to be somewhere and doing something. There is this other rhythm, way, way beyond human rhythm, And it's that that I'm brought into con very, very close contact with through the activity of gardening. avant-garde artists, flowers and gardens were a source of emotional inspiration. They're not so much interested in whether it's a hyacinth, but for many of these artists, um, like Matisse or Emile Nolde, it's really the color. Emile Nolde created gardens wherever he lived, and they were a great inspiration to him. I think the act of gardening also was very spiritual and important to him. Uh, his last garden was created in Siebel, which is on the border of Denmark uh, and Germany, and he um, designed his garden so that the past created uh, two entwined letters that are the initials of himself and his wife. So you know how personal this garden was to him, and it was the great source of inspiration for his art for you know, the last 20 years of his life or so, and it still exists today. I was really intrigued by Emil Nolder's garden at Siebel because he built this jewel-like place, this fantasy realm. He didn't really create the garden um, as a place to be experienced as a series of pictures, as uh, a tableau. 
He created the garden as um, an intense space in which you are immersed, and that's the feeling you have when you go into the garden today. There are a series of winding paths around beds which are absolutely chock-filled with all kinds of bright and colourful flowers which have not been, and we can see this in the paintings, which were not chosen for their uh, compatibility with each other necessarily, but chosen for the incredible uh, colours they exhibit and which Nolder was then able to uh, experiment with in paint. Emil Nolda is an artist who's very invested in the project of modernity, and he wants to paint in a certain way that's very basic. It's primal. He wants to get at the most basic level of intense human emotion. And he uses a technique that's meant to convey that. And for example, if you look at his paintings from the 20s, he paints on very rough burlap. I mean, it's really rugged. And he paints with incredibly heavy brush strokes. I mean, just caked on paint. And if you'll notice, it's very matte. And that's partly because when you're painting with oil, the oil soaks into that. And he leaves these very heavily encrusted surfaces. It's very rough and rugged. Uh, and it's very shocking to, to many people to see a painting in that condition, but that's what he wanted. He wanted something that wasn't refined. And, I mean, he was the enemy of the refined, and he wanted that sense of rawness and intense emotion in his paintings. I think for many of these artists, this was a spiritual experience for them. It was a connection with nature. I mean, it is kind of amazing to think that artists like Matisse or Kandinsky, who are so theoretical, and would be interested in nature in this way, but it was their way of connecting. And for example, there's a fantastic painting in this exhibition that's of a garden in Tangiers. And Matisse had for years been painting very conceptual works, severe in their geometry. And he said specifically when he wrote a letter requesting permission to see this Islamic garden that he wanted to reconnect with nature. And he was extremely excited about this garden that he saw in North Africa through the wildness, the exotic plants. And he painted the first of three pictures, which the first one is in this exhibition, in a flash of inspiration. It's just, you know, quickly applied paint over, you can still see pencil drawing. He even took the backside of the brush and scratched into the surface. And it's just an explosion of color and emotion. So. It was very important for Matisse and for some of these other artists who were thinking so theoretically to find a way to connect with nature, and gardens provided that opportunity. For the Fauve artists, of course, who, uh, whose greatest contribution to modern art was arbitrary color, um, they, could, they could be inspired by the intensity of these tones, and Matisse wrote evocatively about that. For Matisse, we know that he did have a garden at his home, um, he spent a lot of time in it. Uh, we're told he greeted uh, visitors wearing a gardener's smock. He would give them flowers for presents. He would use them for inspiration and, and for studying color theory. And then even into later life, uh, Matisse wrote that um, when he was confined to his studio or ill for some reason, he would turn his studio into a garden. And you, you can see his studio with these wild growing, um, sometimes exotic plants imported from Mexico. And it was a constant source of inspiration for him. And even if you look at the late paper cutouts, you can see these large paintings of bushes and gardens and plants and flowers. And it was, it was crucial for Matisse's uh, artistic inspiration. And I also think just his, his spiritual and mental health. There's a very close connection between Monet the gardener and Monet the painter and 
This painting of Daylilies is wonderful for the fact that he has really captured what the daylily is all about. And there's something very vigorous about this painting, the way that you have this explosion of leaves that are so particular to daylilies, and then this suspense with the stem that then supports the flower that only blooms for a day. And when it does, it peels itself back uh, facing the sky and absorbs all that light in this brilliant moment, this flash of orange, which he's then contrasted against these cooler mauves and greens behind. So you get that flare which happens with this plant that's so absolutely particular to that plant. And I just love how beautifully observed this is and I can really feel how well he's understood those plants and how they've actually made this part of his garden into what it is. It's probably why you go to that particular part of the garden just to be there with those daylilies when they're doing their thing. From uh, 1914, there's a major shift in Monet's work. He remains completely engaged and obsessed with the water lily pond as a subject, but he starts working on a much bigger scale and he builds a new large studio, especially to make these very large uh, canvases. And of course, he, he saw this project, he called it his Grand Decoration, my, my great decorations. And his idea was to make a huge decorative cycle of the water lily pond theme. These great uh, grand decorations happened right on the eve of the First World War. The fact is he had stopped painting uh, practically for several years. Uh, he was devastated by the death of his wife, Alice, in um, 1911. And then he developed some cataracts. And then there was the death of one of his sons uh, in early 1914. And Monet was really kind of at a crossroads, not knowing quite what to do. And then that spring and summer, he decided 
that he was going to do a project that he had dreamed of for 20 years. Uh, and that was a project of creating entire environments of paintings that would totally engulf and surround the viewer. So he was about to do this, to launch into this new project. And what happened? The First World War broke out. Uh, Giverny was practically deserted. They're very close to the front lines. He could hear cannon shells. And he really decides that he has to do this project. There's a point at which, in 1916, when Monet's son comes back to visit, and Monet writes very poignantly about how I'm alone most of the time except for his stepdaughter, and how guilty he feels about his countrymen dying and suffering um, while he's just painting. And then he responds to that, to his own question, when he says, others can fight, I can paint. This is sort of my duty as a patriotic Frenchman. And it's very clear from Monet's letters that he, he felt that creating these paintings was a kind of expression of his national identity and a patriotic duty. As for me, I'm staying here all the same. And if those savages must kill me, it will be in the middle of my canvases in front of my life's work. I think the large water lily paintings are somewhere between painting and cinema almost. They're, they're like a kind of three screen projection. You can't actually take them in at once. You know, you actually have to kind of scan them, much the way you'd scan a Jackson Pollock actually. And that experience of knowing you're in front of something much bigger than you where there's, there's no edges to it, almost. You know, he didn't paint the edge of the pond. You, you were in it, you fall into those paintings. And it's a rather beautiful place to be. I mean, I, I've thought a lot about the oceanic as a kind of state of mind and whether or not art can have a kind of dialogue with that oceanic state where there's no difference between you and the natural world, there's no boundary. And uh, I suppose for me, Monet's water lily paintings do speak to that oceanic state where perhaps there were no boundaries between Monet and his garden. I have painted a lot of these water lilies, modifying each time my point of view, renewing the subject following seasons of the year and therefore following different luminous effects engendered by these changes. The effect varies incessantly. The essential of the subject is the mirror of the water whose aspect at any one time changes itself thanks to the expanses of sky which reflect in it and spreading life and movement. The passing cloud the freshening breeze, the threatening and falling rain, the sudden gust of wind, the light failing and shining again, so many reasons elusive to the profane eye, which transform the tint and disfigure the body of water. This exhibition originated with a desire to reunite the three panels of Monet's great Agapanthus triptych, Monet, though, never gave those paintings away during his lifetime. He kept them all in the studio. He was constantly reworking them, making them more abstract and ethereal. Uh, it's really amazing to see an artist at his age reworking these great masterworks. And he died then in 1926, and a, and a selection of paintings were taken off their stretchers, moved to the Angerie, and literally glued to the walls there. But many of the great uh, decorations remained in the studio, and in fact, that's true of this uh, triptych. It remained with his family until the 1950s when the paintings um, were sent to America and bought separately by different museums in the United States. So reuniting this triptych is a major event. It's the first time that we know of that this has ever happened in Europe, and it's spectacular to see them together. And they made us really think deeply about not only Monet's great uh, Agapanthus triptych, but also about his interest in gardening and painting gardens, because, of course, they depict the great water garden at Giverny, which is one of the great accomplishments in the history of horticulture. So one of the things you can see is the momentum that is, is set in, in motion for the evolving story of modern art and the role that the garden plays in that. And so, to a certain extent, the effects of that are still rippling down to today. <laughs> 
But of course, the legacy of this kind of painting is in land art. Monet is the first great land artist of the 20th century, as well as the last great impressionist, as well as the precursor of Pollock and Rothko and others, and he's, he's many, many things. But the idea that you divert a river, that you create this extraordinary sight over a, a decade or two, um, certainly has overtones to what people like Robert Smithson were doing out in the American West in the 60s and 70s. And I think that's a very interesting legacy. What I am becoming, you can well imagine. I am working, and not without difficulty, because my sight diminishes each day, and also I look after my garden a lot. This brings me pleasure. And with the beautiful days we have had, I am overjoyed and admire nature. With this, we never have time to be bored. As Monet got older, he became more concerned with abstracting the world around us and trying to look closer and closer and closer at how colour was shaping in an abstract sense, how we see the world. So his, his series of paintings of water lilies are the most profound tests of him as an artist, forcing himself to look, and that's the hardest thing about an artist, the older you get, the more you think you've looked enough to know exactly what's in front of you. And as he considers his great lily ponds here, you notice through the series of paintings that his point of view begins to move more and more and more away from a recognisable subject, away from a sense of a painting receding into the distance towards a horizon where there's a neat little bridge focusing your point of view and increasingly it's just about reflections, patterns of light and colour. But the more I work into one of these paintings I become more and more intrigued by the things that are appearing in the reflections in the water and as Moni spent more and more time here I guess that's what became his passion. He didn't need a bridge anymore, he didn't need a tree trunk all he needed were ripples and cascades of light. And that's a real push in the history of 20th century art towards modernism. Portrait Artist is nearly over and Tuesday night at nine you can follow the winner's journey as they create their career-changing commission of Graham Norton. And coming up next on Sky Arts, we're back among the flora and fauna as we take a stroll through the gardens of Pompeii.